All right, Todd, tell us your idea. What makes you angry? What do you have for us today? Well, I think it would be an idea that I talk about in the in the book we're going to talk about that there's this idea floating around in the church that if people just understand enough about God or scripture in their head, they will automatically grow and experience healing. All right, my friends. Well, welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast. My my cameras are today is not working. So we're going to have to go almost like old school, like, you know, side by side with our guest. But it's going to be amazing. You don't even care. Some of you are just listening to this episode. You don't know the frustration I'm experiencing right now. But this is all about this episode is about the connected life and i have todd's book right here in my hands it's called that the connected life the art and science of relational spirituality so when i read that on the cover i'm like i gotta talk to todd this is amazing and i was reading his story on the book and it's epic it involves divorce so i think we're gonna tackle a little bit of this this topic of divorce in America and in the world, some of the statistics, the harm that is causing to families, it's horrible, okay? But we're also going to talk about the hope and the what to do next. What's the next step? How do we lead into hope? How do we come out of this depressions, anxieties, family disconnections and disorders into a better communication ultimately with our family and a thriving family? So let's go back to Todd. Todd, how are you doing today? Good. It's great to be with you, Beto. Awesome. Hey, Todd. Uh, well, thank you for being on the show. And I'm so excited for this. I love the fact that you even mentioned before we started recording that your wife is from Argentina. Yes. And I love all about that because I think in today's episode, I want to bring a little bit of the stories that come out of Latin America in terms of of connectivity as humans, right? I think yes. it's almost like second nature to 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 people from Latin America to be huggy, to be, you know, uh, spontaneous and things like that, where I feel like in America, we're lacking a little bit of that or a lot. Um, so anyways, you were telling us about like the the most, the craziest idea that you have for today. So can you elaborate a little bit about what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So this idea goes back <clears throat> a long ways, uh, but it's an idea, like I said, that it's sometimes taught, sometimes it's not taught explicitly or overtly in the church, but it's just sort of like the way we operate in the church, which is that, you know, when people are struggling, if they just know enough about God in their head, they should be able to, they should just sort of automatically grow and heal. And I see that sometimes spiritual leaders will, you know, refer people to me who are struggling and they've had a few conversations and they sort of expect instant growth and healing. And that's just not the way human beings work. It's not the way human nature works. So that's a big part of what I talk about in the book is it, that spiritual growth is ultimately about relationships with God and others and growth and healing happens through new relational experiences through new loving experiences. So the phrase I use in the book to kind of capture that Beto is that we are loved into loving, that we grow and heal, not just through what we know about God, that's important too, but, but in a more direct sense, we grow and heal through loving experiences. When other people love us, that shapes our soul and, and allows us to love other people more. Mm, okay. I love that. All right, so there's there. So I call that the kingdom of God. I, I mean, this is maybe my interpretation or the way I understand it when I read scripture. But it's so intricate because uh, the other day I was even talking with my pastor and I was saying when I was younger, I was going to a youth camp and I remember I named the name of the camp. You know, we, we were like given ideas. What should we call this retreat, right? And my... My idea, and this is like 1990 something, right? Maybe 97, something like that. Yeah. Um, and my idea was hyperlinks. 
or hipervínculos in Spanish. And yeah. I remember the guy that came to speak is like, who, who thought about the name of the camp? And it's like, oh, that was Beto. Like, brilliant, brilliant, you're genius. I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I receive it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, oh, all kidding aside, I feel like there is something, in, that's even what caught my attention about your book, The Connected Life, that the more I discover who God is, the more I realize that you're exactly right. There's We have this head knowledge about who God is supposed to be. And to me, I even have almost a problem. I think it's a good problem. But you know that uh, old sir saying that says, um, you know, you love God vertically and you love people horizontally? Yeah. My experience lately has been the more I love horizontally, the more I experience God vertically. Rather, I mean, yeah. I think there's, you can't separate like looking for God and, you know, having your own times with him and you know, alone moments. But it just seems to me like, wow, mm -hmm. there's something here in the horizontal that kind of like points back to to God. So what do you have to say I mean, to, to that as I just elaborated Definitely. on hyperlinks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hyperlinks is great. That is, that is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> But, and I, yeah, I totally agree with you that the vertical and the horizontal dimensions are, are connected. You know, they're, you can't separate them. Like you said, um, you can't love God without loving people. Right. And it's, it's in the new Testament and scripture and all throughout the new Testament, we see the importance of relationships and the body of Christ, you know, to support each other and help each other and grow. Ephesians four talks a lot about that. So it's, it's critical. Yeah. That we, we grow through relationships. And I think that's part of how God, created us like you said we still need direct relationship with god experience you know in prayer and uh, obviously and those are very important but god for you know whatever reason he's chosen to work through each other in the body of christ right that we're supposed to build each other up we're supposed to support each other we're supposed to help each other we're supposed to confront each other when we get out you know when our lives go off the rails in a loving way though and so mm -hmm. it's definitely those are those two are connected All right. So in this realm of connectedness, what are the the elements that are bringing these connections to a crisis? You talk about divorce. Um, is there anything else like what what is pointing to like this brokenness in relationships? Uh, what's your research point to? Right. Yeah. There's a number of of factors here. Um, so you know, so one is just social disconnection has really been on the rise for the last 50 years. There's a lot of research that, you know, sort of documents that. And so part of that is fragmentation of family, divorce you mentioned. So that really started in the, um, you know, probably the 1970s, maybe a little bit before that, where that started to go on the rise. And so I tell a little bit of my story in um, in the book where my parents sep separated and then divorced. And it was right at the peak of this sort of epidemic of divorce. And that really increased until the 19. Uh, 80s, and then it kind of tapered off. But most research kind of agrees that, you know, the dissolution of marriage through some form, either separation or divorce, is around 40 to 50% today. So mm -hmm. it has tapered off a little bit. But, you know, since the 1950s and 1970s, it's increased. And so that's caused this fragmentation of family. There's a lot of research showing that community involvement has decreased over the last 50 years. So Robert Putnam is one of the researchers has done a lot of work in that area. He wrote a landmark book called Bowling Alone that documents mm. a lot of this, the decline in what he calls social capital, which really is connection, connectedness wow. and community. So like one of the stories I tell in my book, Beto, is my, my father-in-law um, who grew up in Argentina, he's involved in uh, the Lions Club. You know, it's one of these community clubs. They, they do a lot of great things for the community. They raise money for charities and things like that. And, you know, my generation and your generation, we're just not involved in organizations like that very much. I've never been, none of my friends are. That's something we've kind of lost. Um, so, um, you know, it's, and then with that social disconnection, we've seen a rise in mental health problems, you know, in the last 50 years. And, um, you know, particularly even just when you go back to, you know, with the rise of social media and the iPhone, we see you know, around 2008, we see spikes in anxiety and depression that were not there 50 years ago. So it's not, you know, in like preteens and teenagers, not just something that is part of being that, you know, in that age group wasn't there 50 years ago. Wow. So um, yeah, there's a lot of factors. So the, and then of course the pandemic, obviously, but 
that just really exacerbated these trends that were already going on, I think. Mm. And so there's just, um, so I, what I'm finding is more and more Christians feeling very disconnected from, from God, you know, from others in community pandemic just really made that worse, right. As churches had to shut down and go online. <clears throat> and so there's this kind of growing sense of just emptiness, this nagging sense of emptiness. And we're all kind of searching for meaning and trying to make sense of our lives. And so, you know, that's, that's one of the messages of the book is that we, we need to find meaning. It comes through relationships with God and others. We often search for it in ways that are misguided and actually mm-hmm. kind of hurt ourselves. Um, but we need to kind of uh, really look for that in God and other people and, and secure healthy relationships. Yes. All right. So you talked about epidemic, like it's a, uh, so even, even as, as we just experience a pandemic, right? Uh, it started spreading out and then it changes names according to you know how much it spreads and in which right. countries it's present. And it's almost understandable when there's a virus and it's a disease. But in this case, I mean, is it, is the epidemic almost like a social contagion? Is it something like, almost like, uh, no, that, that experiment of uh, yawning, right? You're like, uh, and then the next person does the yeah. same. And I don't know if even, maybe even happens through computers, right? Like you see somebody yawning and it produces something in your brain that yeah. you end up yawning. So is that what you mean with epidemic? Is that, or what do you mean when you say yeah, yeah. So we'll see if I start yawning on the podcast here, right? <laughs> <laughs> it goes through computers, but yeah, yawning is contagious. Emotions are contagious, but yes, I think um, there's just a lot of factors in our society that are promoting uh, disconnection, you know, and, and I should have mentioned, you know, loneliness is being called an epidemic even before the pandemic. That's another big, big piece of this. Um, and so it's just, yeah, more people, uh, you know, growing up, Uh, with just more unhealthy relationships and more loneliness. And that just kind of creates these conditions where people don't, don't have, and, and social media, I think is, is part of that. It's not all bad, but it, there are some negative effects of it where people, you know, especially Gen Z is growing up with less of these secure, healthy attachment bonds and relationships that really need to, to be there for us to find meaning and to uh, be spiritually healthy. Okay. And then when we talk about divorce, I would love to get to know your story a little bit. Actually, I'll start with mine, you know, because I feel it would be a little unfair to just say, tell me about your parents' divorce. Uh, the reason why I want to know is because I, my parents got divorced too, you know, when I was, I don't even remember, like around 10, 11 or so, you know, mm -hmm. back in the, in the 80s. And I mean, it's almost like you don't know what's going on until later on, right? Mm -hmm. As a kid, like you don't, You may understand a little bit about, okay, they're separating. You may understand a little bit of your own emotions. But I feel like in a bigger sense, uh, you don't realize how deep that is until later on. Uh, so with that, I mean, after you tell me about your story, I want to kind of like come back to saying, can we even learn how to forgive our own parents because of those decisions, because I feel like it's important for, for those of us who have experienced it uh, to find our own healing, you know, and almost to say to our parents, hey, it's okay. It, it might have sucked. It might have been you know, chaotic, but I love you. You know, you're my parent. I love you. I don't blame you for your decisions. I don't know if there's something to that, but uh, mm -hmm. let's start with your story, like, because uh, I think it's very prominent in, in the connected life as, as you talk about your own experience. Right. Definitely. Yeah. So, so my parents separated first when I was about nine. So and this would have been late 1970s. So as I mentioned, right at the peak of this, you know, epidemic of divorce, where it was becoming really common. And I think I mentioned in the book of, you know, my little circle of friends, when this happened, when I was, it was the summer after I was in fourth grade, all, all but one of them came from divorced families already by that, by that point. Um, so it just was something that was becoming pretty normal at that point. And I think you're right, Beto, that you don't, as a kid at that age, you don't really realize the impact, you know, you know, something's going on. You may feel a little bit of the pain of that definitely, but you have to cope, right? So you learn ways of coping. And that's part of what happens with, when there's, that creates some insecurity in these attachment relationships. And so you have to learn how to protect yourself emotionally and cope. And that's, good in a certain way, but it, there's also a cost. 
there's always a cost to these ways of protecting yourself and, and coping. And so that's, you know, that, that happened to me. So my parents separated, then they later divorced. Um, and I lived with my dad had less contact with my mom. And so there was definite insecurity there and ways that I learned to cope. And then later I realized I felt really distant from God and struggled with a lot of, you know, just dryness and spiritual, um, spiritual dryness and, and distance from God. And I realized later that it was connected to, you know, just my, my experience in my family growing up in the, the separation, divorce, and some of the dysfunction in the family. So that sort of was a filter through which I experienced God. You know, there were similar expectations. That's one of the things I talk about in the book is that we have these close relationships when there's insecurity there with parental type figures we automatically project that onto God and have the same gut level expectations, you know, even though I know things, I know God is loving, right. But not at a deep level, I'm not really convinced God's going to be there for me, you know? So that was my experience. Okay. So I feel like a lot of people experiment exactly what you described. It's almost like the, the way you interact with your parents is going to be big part on how you see God, right? And I think a lot of people have talked about that, almost like if your father figure, like your humanly father figure is broken, you might have broken ideas of who this loving God is. So in a sense, it's almost like if we were talking about the horizontal and the vertical, if there's brokenness in the horizontal, there's going to be brokenness in your vertical. You're not going to have the accurate depiction of who God is. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> Brilliantly said, Beto. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. And, you know, just to maybe expand on that, you said, you know, so we have broken ideas about God. Right. So one of the big ideas in the book is this idea of relational knowledge. And so I would just say we have ideas that are conscious about God. Right. And that's what I talk about as explicit knowledge in the book. That's what scientists call it. But we also have what you might call our deep beliefs or implicit beliefs or relational knowledge about God. And so that's, those are the ideas that they're not, they're not up here, right? They're in our hearts or our guts. Mm -hmm. And, and so why that's so important, Beto, is that's what actually drives how we actually experience God and other people, you know, horizontally and, uh, and how we actually relate. Uh -huh. Okay. Some pastors describe it as God is the code You know, it's it, and it's almost like back to this idea of hyperlinks. It, as humans, if you think about it, like our brains are connecting right now through a computer, but really we're having a conversation, even though we're far apart. And intellectually, right, we're we're having an exchange of ideas, and that is connecting us as humans. And so, what you're saying is that there's almost like this this head knowledge, the informational side of us that needs to process data right in a sense right. but there's also another type of processing which is more like the matters of the heart right, right? and so tell me a little bit about that because the how can we help people uh, move from head to heart like what are the matters of the heart uh, how can we almost like tangibly say You know, if you're dealing with this, you're dealing with a matter of the heart and not a matter of knowledge or matter of the head. What I mean, right. a little more on the difference between those two. Right. Yeah. So there's these two ways of knowing I talk about in the book. So head knowledge or explicit knowledge, as you put it, <clears throat> and then implicit knowledge. And when it comes to relationships, we can call it implicit relational knowledge. And they're, you know, they're both important when things are working well and we're healthy, they, they work together. And they're integrated. So that's what I call the knowledge spiral. But oftentimes when you get off track and they get separated or disconnected, right? So we might know things about God or scripture or how we're supposed to live in our head. But like you said, it doesn't sink into our hearts or implicit knowledge. So, so sometimes I talk about the, the implicit self is another way to describe that. And yeah, again, that's what drives how we relate. And you can see there's a problem, there's a disconnect sometimes when people know things about God, but That, you know, like in my own life, you know, feeling distant or dry from God, you know, those kinds of things um, that shows there's a disconnect. Right. Because if I if I really knew in my heart <laughs> that God has forgiven me, that God is love, that God has a, you know, um, that God is always good. You know, all these things we know about him from Scripture, then I would experience that. Right. 
but I don't always experience that because there's this disconnect. So that's, that's really the growth process is changing that directly requires new relational experiences. Uh So relational experiences is the code, if you will, if we think about a computer analogy, right? We write code, the code that tells us how to relate in a way that gives us the best chance of connection given our experience as a, ch- as a child mm-hmm. is implicit. It's not conscious. Wow. And so we have to rewire that code, but that doesn't happen directly through just knowing stuff about God, right? So reading scripture, studying theology, those things are very important because they, they provide the parameters for understanding how to live and what, how God wants us to live, right? How we're supposed to live but it doesn't directly rewire that code that happens through new relational experiences. And I'm careful to point out when I'm talking about this with God as well, directly, it's not, it, you know, and people, but like you talked about earlier, prayer, right? Experiencing God through prayer, silence and solitude, spiritual disciplines, all those things are, are means or ways that we can directly experience God and, and God can directly rewire that code and does. And I've experienced that. Right. But he also uses people, right? Yes. We have new relational experiences that sometimes disrupt our negative expectations, right? So maybe you're, you know, meeting with a friend or a mentor, maybe it's a pastor, and you have these kind of negative expectations from childhood that this person, you know, they're not going to really listen. They're not going to really care. They'll go through the motions, right? And then the person actually comes through and actually demonstrates and shows that they really care. You know, they call you, they not only pray for you, they call you back, they check on you, they really listen, right? Yeah. That starts to create this new experience and starts to rewire that code internally. Wow. So basically what you're saying is people stop believing in God, perhaps because they stop believing in humanity, like in a sense, like they lost hope on humanity and therefore their vision of God is broken. And it's like, how can How can there be goodness coming from this God that created the universe if all that I all I've experienced is is uh you know these chaotic relationships and disconnected relationships? And what you're saying is then uh a person with the almost like with the right vision of who God is, and this is what I love because I to me this is what I would call faith. Uh it's acting upon that knowledge. And making it a reality through basically your hands and feet, right? So yeah. getting from the head knowledge to the heart. And once you experience that, what you're saying is that starts rewiring people's past, really. Like their their bad experience, like their bad memories. Are those bad memories, like, do they ever come back or are they just replaced? Um, can we get rid of bad memories? Yeah. So great question. Let me come back to that. But I love what you said, Beto. I think that's you know, that people sometimes stop believing in God or, or maybe struggle with God because of human relationships. And I think that's, that's, there's so much truth to that, right? Because, you know, so we're created in the image of God, right? That, that we believe scripture teaches that. And so we're supposed to reflect God to the world, right? And we don't always do that very well. And so when people have these negative, painful experiences, you know, sometimes that that it is a reflection of God to them, especially when it's in a Christian context. And that does cause problems in their, their view of God. Sometimes it's conscious, you know, the conscious explicit beliefs, but oftentimes it's this deeper implicit rewiring. Definitely. And then, so back to your question about memories. Yes. Memories from early experiences and childhood can definitely come back consciously. They also are recorded in what's called implicit memory. So that's this gut level form of memory And so they, they shape or our perception without our awareness and that's always going on, but they can be, they can be rewired so that our expectations that are based on those memories can change. Right. So, I mean, obviously we can't change events and there's, you know, there's the explicit aspect of the memory, right. Which is like, usually when we talk about memory, we're talking about explicit memory, right. Which, which is like, Oh, I remember, earlier today when my camera broke and I had to, right, (laughs) you know, try to fix it, all that. Right. But then there's this gut level implicit memory that we don't have conscious awareness of. And that can also, you know, that creates these expectations. Mm. So that's what can change. Right. So I tell people, and you know, when I'm teaching students about therapy and sometimes to clients in therapy that, 
you know, you, yeah, you can't change the event. Sometimes clients will come in and, and be very discouraged and think, well, yeah, this stuff happened to me. It's so painful. I can't change that. Right. What's the point of talking about it? Right. Mm -hmm. The point of talking about it is no, you can't change what happened, but you can change your perception of what happened. You can rewire oh. your feeling about what happened. Wow. The expectations that come out of that. Wow. That is totally new to me because I tend to think about hope as almost like what you were describing, like we can change these memories, but I always think of hope um, to the future, right? I'm creating a better picture of what my future can be. But in this case, you're also saying that there is an element of uh, reinterpreting the past. And I think yes. that's, I mean, that's, Well, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, how do we reinterpret the past? Like, are there techniques? Like, what do we do to help people say, yes, that that happened to you was real. But if you see it from this other lens, you know, you you'll start rewiring that and changing your interpretation. That's brilliant. Right, I right. love that. Yeah. So a big a big part of that is telling our story. So the more we can tell our story in a coherent way, which means that we can be honest about the pain and stay connected to someone while we're talking about it and not, you know, we tend to go to two extremes that are unhealthy, right? One is, one is we're either shut down. That's called dismissing attachment. We don't have access to our emotions. And so when we tell our, you know, people who struggle with that don't tend to tell their story very much. And when they do, it's not, there's, there's, there's no sense of emo the emotional meaning of the story. The other extreme is what's called preoccupied attachment. And that's when we tap into some pain and it just takes over and you become, you know, really dis dysregulated and you have trouble kind of telling a story that, that is logical and coherent in that way. So as we tell our story and share, you know, painful things that have happened to somebody who's trustworthy, right. <clears throat> and, and have a good experience, you know, from them that's loving and receptive and those kinds of things. Um, that starts to rewire the perception of those events. So, so in, in a broader sense, there's two things I talk about in the book in terms of how change happens, trans transformational change or deep growth, as I call it. So one is feeling an idea and the other is interpreting our experience. And so this is sort of the bottom up and top down, you know, kind of approach. So feeling an idea is, you know, we start with these ideas, explicit knowledge of scripture, God, you know, things like that. We have to have experiences that help us feel those ideas. And so story is like a primary mm -hmm. mechanism that does that. So I talk about, you know, wow. hearing stories, hearing other people tell their stories, like when we hear testimonies at church, right? Yes. Hearing those stories helps us to feel the idea. That's essentially, as you put it, explicit knowledge sinking down into our heart, right? You know, stories in books and movies, That's wow. what they do, right? They help us to feel ideas. And I give some examples of that. They don't, they don't, you know, the main idea of a movie is not spelled out for us, right? Yeah. It's, it's shown through the actions in the story. Mm. Wow. That, so, yeah. Okay. So I give an example of that, you know, just the, like Star Wars, something everybody knows, like the, I forget which episode, like maybe the second one or something, you know, Luke Skywalker is fighting Darth Vader. And the emperor's behind him, goading him on to give into his anger, right? Mm -hmm. And so Luke kind of, there's one scene where he just, he goes crazy on Darth Vader and cuts off his arm, right? And the emperor's there, to, you know, goading him again, like, give into your anger, come to the dark side type of thing, right? And so you, you see Luke pause. I think he turns off his lightsaber. And you can see he's processing, right? He has a choice in that moment. He can just continue to go down this path of going nuts, giving into his anger and trying to kill Vader, right? Or he can, you know, trust the force, right? <laughs> yeah. And and seek good, right? And so, but it, they don't tell us that, right? Wow. It's not explicit knowledge, uh -huh. but we see him turn off his lifesaver and throw it to the ground. Mm. And in that action, you feel the idea yes. that when we seek the greater good of humanity through the force, you know, in that context of that story. Wow good things happen. So Oof. that's, that's a big part of it. And then interpreting yeah. our experience is the bottom up 
part, right? So the other one is top down, feeling idea. Interpreting experience is bottom up, right? So you have, you know, we all have experiences we need to process, right? And that's a big, huge part of therapy is putting words and language to our experiences, which is essentially telling our story, right? Mm. And so when you do that, it helps you take this sort of formless, you know, experience that's, you know, maybe painful. Putting words to it helps you to kind of get a handle on it. It helps you to bring it, to connect it to another person, right? So they can kind of see it more clearly. And that process of doing that actually changes the experience. Wow. Okay. So, well, okay. This is epic. Uh, but I mean, I got stuck on this part when you talked about Darth Vader because uh, <laughs> he, first of all, was this the second time he was getting his arm caught? I, I think don't so. remember. <laughs> Because I think in the in the latest movies, which are the previous movies, I think they cut all his extremities. Uh, so this might have been the second time he's been hurt. The first one was Obi Wan cutting him, and the second one was his son. But in a sense, I love that that almost like coming back to his senses of of Luke. Because let's talk about divorce. Let's say and no to kind of like bring it back to to what I said about forgiving our our parents. Yeah. Uh, it, let's say. Let's say um, Darth Vader is the embodiment of divorce, of that brokenness, of that hurt. And let's say this evil guy is, is the evil one, exactly <laughs> who he is, right? And he's pretty much put in, in young Luke this thought of like, hey, you're so, you're so angry that even if this guy is your dad, even if he's your parent... You know, all that anger, all that uh, emotion, all that uh, frustration that you have because of all the years of the divorce, you know, this is your payback time. And in a sense, like he comes back to his senses and, and, and I guess he, he comes back to like the humanity of who Darth Vader is, right? Even though he's a beast, even though he's you know, <coughs> the devil incarnate, uh, He was created in the image of God, right? Like he, he's a human. He's my dad. Um, <laughs> and I, I right. think it's not until later when he realizes that, but uh, the fact that he says, this is a human being, right? And that's mm -hmm. what you're talking about, that, that uh, it's almost like that's the moral of the story. And that's what, that's really what we're learning when we watch a movie. And I love all of that because ultimately, uh, let me cough here. Sorry, excuse me. So, I love that because ultimately you were talking about story and narrative, right? Right. And I feel like that's what makes any story epic. The fact that when you watch a movie, it moves you because of all the ideas that it's portraying, right? And, right. and when they move you, maybe it's because that head knowledge, it's coming into your heart and it's moving even exactly. the fibers that you don't even know that are there. Right. Uh, sometimes you do know. Uh, and I love because that is the difference between a movie with hope and a movie without hope. And a movie without hope, you know, like I saw this movie. I don't know people. Some people might have seen it, but um, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it kind of like talks about like this real happening that you know, happened to you know, people in the Hollywood industry. But the whole movie is about revenge. Mm -hmm. And it's almost <laughs> like if you yeah. compare it to the story that you just said about Darth Vader, In this case, he came back to his senses and he he kind of like learned to forgive, right? Luke learned yeah, to forgive Luke, and said, right. okay. And in this other case, no, they bring a flame um, flamethrower and they burn the people that committed the evil act, right? And maybe rightfully so for the people that experience it, they're, they're really not coming out in rage and saying, this is my payback, which mm -hmm. is exactly what Luke didn't, didn't fulfill right he i know mm -hmm. i want i have revenge in me but th there's got to be something bigger than that and that's the difference between these narratives of of hope and forgiveness and you know, retaliation so let's right. bring that back to our own stories yeah right yeah uh, so how do we help people start seeing uh i mean we change i don't know i mean just elaborate a little bit on that like what do sure. you feel when as I'm, as i'm saying yeah this? Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. So, I mean, both of those stories are causing 
people watching them to feel an idea, right? There's a, you know, in movies and stories, it's often called the controlling idea, right? The big idea it's trying to get across. And again, it doesn't do it by, you know, a statement. <laughs> it's not teaching, right? It's, it's helping you feel the idea through the actions and, and how the protagonist solves the big problem. And so in one case, you're talking about this, you know, this other movie, I haven't seen that, but the, the idea that you're feeling when you watch the movie is about revenge, right? Yeah, it's like that we should take revenge. That's the path forward, right? Whereas the other one with, with Luke is about forgiveness, right? So they're shaping us in different ways. So feeling an idea shapes our soul in a way and motivates us to act in a certain way. So yeah, growing and healing. So I think with, you know, back to, back to divorce, definitely part of our own growth and healing process is forgiveness is for, forgiving our parents and understanding, you know, part of that is as you get older, right. You said like when you're a kid, you don't really know what's going on. As you get older, you start to be able to understand that, you know, our parents were struggling with their own things. Right. And so you can sort of take perspective and, and, and that helps with the forgiveness process. And ultimately I think that comes from God, right. Just, it comes from knowing that no, knowing at a gut level that I am a sinner and that God has forgiven me and that I don't deserve that, right? I'm, that I'm not better than my parents or anyone else. And that helps me to forgive them and, and others. And, and so what that means is not holding things against them, right? Wow, that's so good. Okay, so before we go to our emojis to kind of like um, come to the our takeaways of this episode, I just want to ask this. Is there... Is there another question I should be asking for today's episode when it comes to divorce, uh, when it comes to helping people heal, when it comes to rewiring our, our memories? Is there is there another question I should be asking that maybe you, you'd like to say and like, oh, we didn't touch this and this is important? Yeah, I guess that would be, you know, how does spiritual community play into this? And so there's a chapter in the in the book on that. And so I think that's ultimately the context, you know, the body of Christ speaking, you know, from a Christian worldview perspective that, you know, that's God's answer. So it's relationship, but in with God and others in the context of the body of Christ, that we help each other grow and become sanctified, right. To become more loving. So that's the, again, the idea of being loved into loving that that should be happening prim primarily in the context of the body of Christ and spiritual community. So we need to think about how do we structure our spiritual communities in a way that really promotes that. And so I talk a little bit about that in the book. Some of that's just paying attention to the size of our groups, right? That there's a certain mm -hmm. purpose for larger groups with worship. And then, but we also need smaller groups where there's more intimate connection, right? Where we can tell our stories like we were just talking about yes. um, and, and shape each other and mold each other and support each other and develop more kind of attachment type relationships and then as we do that we become a light to the world and that's god's plan right wow oof this is so good todd amazing okay so i guess one final question before going to the emojis and and do our takeaways would be i love you know back to your your argentinian wife yes. uh, and i just said right before coming on the show that's why even you know the cameras weren't working and stuff like that because i was doing this podcast in Spanish, it's called the same thing, you know, and I want to invite people that are listening right now. If for whatever reason you happen to speak Spanish, check out El Cristian Podcast in Español right here on Spotify or iTunes. Um, no, next week we're going to start our YouTube channel too. And my goal, my dream is to kind of like start blending in, like bridging uh, the experiences that we have as Latin American people uh, Because our our communities tend to have a lot of that that we're lacking here in the U.S., right? You you started yes. with you know, this this uh, phrase of bowling alone and the loneliness epidemic, and in a sense, I mean, I'm sure you know Latin America has its own problems, right? But to me, my experience was we didn't have that type of problem. Community right. was a, a granted for us, right? So yeah, would you yeah. elaborate and a little bit about that connection between, you know, the different types of societies maybe and your experience yeah, with the yeah, Argentinian wife? Definitely. Yeah, I think different different cultures have different strengths and weaknesses, right? And it's important to pay attention to that. But I definitely think, yeah, my experience with my wife and her family from Argentina and the Latin Latin American culture is very connected in community and and the family and, you know, much more so than my family. 
<clears throat> in a lot of ways. And there's something very beautiful about that. So I think it's great that you're yeah, bridging these, these two worlds in your podcast. But I told you, you know, Memorial Day. So we're going to, you know, my in-laws <laughs> later today to, to do an asado and, you know, which is the Argentine barbecue, which they love. And there's just the, the family ties are very close and connected. And I saw that, you know, I visited Argentina, with my wife and I, after we got married and visit her family down there. And there's just, yes, so much connection among family and in the communities. And um, I can see that in, you know, the way my wife parents and just are in connection with, you know, my in-laws and the generation, the grandparents are just very involved. They're close and it's, it's beautiful. I think we need a lot more of that in the, you know, Western culture here in the United States. Definitely. Wow. So good. Okay. So the takeaway is you need to marry a Latin American spouse. We'll just leave it <laughs> at <you> that. <laughs> okay. So this is what we're going to do. First of all, I want to give you my emoji reaction to this episode. And then we're going to go to your own takeaways or what you want to leave people with um, as we walk through our five emojis. But first, I'm going to take you to my emoji tombola. And I'm going to see if I can do it because... Like I said, my, my whole system was kind of like wacky today, but we'll see. So Emoji Tombola, are you there? Reveal the emoji we're going to have today. Yes, it's working. And it's a holy emoji for the connected life. Holy emoji. I think this is totally about the other, totally about uh, experiencing life together. And to me, that's what holy means. But now we're going to go to you, Todd. So from your vantage point, again, to kind of like summarize or give your takeaways, what is the most blasphemous idea that you can think of when it comes to the connected life? I guess the most blasphemous idea would be that we don't need other people to grow and we can do it on our own. Wow. We don't need other people to grow and we can do it on our own. So good. All right. That's the blasphemous idea for today. Skeptical. What are you skeptical of in the connected life? Or where did you see skepticism played out? Yeah, skepticism might be, you know, there's some folks in the church who are skeptical of psychology and what that brings in terms of helping us understand healing and spiritual growth. Love it. Inspired. What gives you hope? Where did you see inspiration? I think a, a renewed emphasis on spiritual formation in the church in the last 20 years and, and relationships within that context. Love it. Next one is holy. So what is a holy idea in this realm? Holy idea would be that I think, as I mentioned, that we are loved into loving and that that love ultimately is the love that comes from God from the Trinity, the love that has existed between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity, we get to actually experience that love and pass it on to others. Love it. And finally, the most divine idea or takeaway from this episode. Wow. Uh, maybe that we can live out this being loved into loving in the body of Christ in spiritual community. And then, like I said, show God's love to the world through our community and the way we love each other. That was so good, Todd. That was amazing. I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank this has you, been man. super helpful. This has been phenomenal. I love the fact that, you know, your your wife is Argentinian and then you're going to go have an amazing asado. I almost envy yes. you right now. If it weren't come because... Down, come on down to Whittier. <laughs> you can join us, Beto. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm not that far away. Um, right. But my wife is an, am an amazing Mexican cook. So on that, That's you great. know, maybe one day you want to come here too and have tamales or tacos. 
in. No, That'd we're going to build the community. Thank you so much for being on the show, Todd. Can you point people to to your resources? Where do you want to point people to to find more about the work you do? Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, the Connected Life, um, the, the several sites, theconnectedlife.org is where you'll get kind of my Christian spirituality um, content resources, including the Connected Life book. There's a previous book that's ac an academic book called Relational Spirituality that came out a year ago. And there's some highlights on that on that website as well. And then drtodhall.com is my sort of general website that talks more about consulting work I do and things like that. Love it. Thank you so much. All right, my friends. Thank you for being here. For those of you who are live on Facebook, thank you for watching. And I want to invite you, if this episode was helpful for you, and I'm looking at my other camera when that one's not working, so I should be looking here. <laughs> If this episode was helpful, share it with friends and family, right? Subscribe to the episodes, follow us on YouTube. Our YouTube page is growing too. And visit us at christianpodcast.com. You know I love emojis. If you have your own emoji reaction, well, come on on the, on the website and choose your own emoji. For every episode we do, you can choose uh, one out of the five emojis and you can rate the episodes with emojis right if you think the episode is blasphemous click on the blasphemous if you think it's divine click on divine if you found inspiration click on inspire i'll see you guys on the next one thank you and nos vemos a la próxima